All right, well, um, the, the organizers of this uh, fan fest decided uh, that there would actually be a, uh, people interested in, 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 in coming here and listening to me suck the oxygen out of the room for, for, for about an hour and, and read from, from something I've been working on. Um, let me uh, be the first to say that uh, just because you know how to use a word processor um, doesn't mean you know how to actually pronounce or speak or enunciate the language properly, as uh, my, uh, my region of, of upbringing uh, probably has done more to butcher the English language than, than anywhere else in the world, particularly if you've ever seen uh, the show Jersey Shore, you know what I'm talking about. Um, not, uh, they would not have made Shakespeare happy. Anyway, um, the, uh, I just finished writing uh, literally uh, uh, the second book in, in my career. It's called uh, Eve Templar One. Uh, it's a true sequel to Empyrean Age. And the purpose of that book um, is to uh, tell the story, introduce Dust 514 um, to the Eve universe. Um, Suffice to say that uh, I learned a lot from, from writing the first book. I made a lot of mistakes. I'll be the first to admit that. I did a few things right. Um, and uh, let's just say that writing the second one was an order of magnitude more difficult, uh, if for no other reason than the fact that I was very conscientious of the, of the things I didn't do well the first time around. So um, all that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try and fumble my way through reading this for you. And then after that, I've, I've prepared a, a short presentation about the state of the IP as it stands today. And uh, again, let me, let me preface this by saying that uh, no speaky ingly that well e. So uh, mm, bear with me as I try to get through the dialogue in this thing as well. All right. So what I'm about to read from you is a chapter from the book. And the events that you are about to hear happened 70 years ago in, in, in our timeline. Jacus Roden stared at the disassembled engine cowling, convinced that the biggest mistake of his young life was coming to Mernois. Parts and tools lay strewn all over the hangar, and much to his disgust, a few empty bottles as well. The hired help, a motley crew of local Antakis with average mechanical skills at best, had left more than an hour ago, unable to fix the disabled shuttle. Its battered carcass hung from hydraulic lifts that ran from the floor to the retractable roof above and represented what was probably the last business his fledgling company would ever get. His greatest frustration was that he knew exactly what the problem was and how to fix it. There was structural damage to the ion turbofans, acute deformations which suggested the pilot had flown through a debris cloud, which was certainly consistent with the nicks and scratches everywhere else on the dilapidated craft. The delicate sensors embedded within the intakes that monitored airflow had been mashed to bits, replacing them with straightforward, but tedious. Unfortunately, he lacked the funds to purchase any of the parts, let alone rent the equipment needed to install them. The owner of this Banshee-class shuttle refused to pay anything up front, and with this being the latest in a string of contractual failures, his line of credit, with his finances and reputation, had reached its end. There had been opportunity here at Camp Stockton. Raised in a terraforming colony on a Prulee 4, Roden was born with an entrepreneurial spirit, eager to leave his family for brighter horizons. Few could blame him. This was a period of unprecedented growth for the Galente Federation, who actively encouraged ambitious souls like Jacobs to settle new worlds. With countless growth opportunities throughout the cluster, a strong navy for protection, and enough government-issued credit to support startup ventures, the chance to embark on a journey towards riches and adventure was an intoxicating prospect. But sometimes, the destination differs from expectations, no matter how much hope there was when the journey began. Jacus grabbed the spanner and heaved it towards the shuttle in anger. But the emotional release backfired horribly as he felt sharp, tearing pain in his shoulder. The tool clanged to the ground well short of its intended target. Humiliated, he cursed loudly. It was then, just when he began to accept defeat, that he heard a violent series of crashes outside the shop. Jake had suspected a speeder accident. It wasn't uncommon for colonists to race them through the long, perfectly straight alleyways of the industrial settlement. Pulling a respirator around his face, 
He ventured through the light airlock and into the thin, cold air of Murnois. He was right. The speeder had come to rest on its side outside the outer walls of the hangar. Whoever was inside would be pinned down between the structure's exosteel and the energy-absorbing crash foam of the interior. With a throbbing shoulder, Jacobs hurried back inside and jumped into the shop's only MTAC, an old two-armed cargo rig retrofitted with the cutting winch for working the underside of dropships. Opening the hangar door, Jacobs marched the vehicle out back outside and used its tripedal arms to clasp the disabled speeder and pull it away. As soon as the top of the vehicle spun around, Jacobs heard a sharp pop and was blinded. A burst of sparks stung into his face. As he instinctively raised his arms, the MTAC's actuators barely mimicked his actions in time as more rounds slammed into them. Jacobs realized he was being shot at by someone inside the vehicle. Panicking, he attempted to sidestep and quickly turned the rickety machine around. But the move overwhelmed the old gyroscopes and it toppled over in a heap. Jacobs screamed in agony. The impact drove his injured shoulder hard into the steel roll bars. He thought for certain that this was how his life would end. But the kill shot never came. In fact, all he could hear was wheezing now as the speeder victim began asphyxiating. It took a minute for Jacobs to get the machine back onto its feet, and now he was hearing sirens. The colony's security forces had mobilized. For reasons he didn't understand, not even in retrospect, Jacobs knew he had to get that speeder off the street and out of sight. The victim had passed out. He would be dead in minutes. Working with just one arm, Jacobs grabbed him by his shirt collar, to hell with being gentle, and pushed him back into the driver's seat, pulling a respirator over his face. Then he took the gun and shoved it into his pants. It was here when he noticed the cache of drugs sticking out of the cash foam, the crash foam. Perfectly arranged pills, cylinders, vials, and a silver nozzle injector, and an inhaler engraved with the logo of, of, logo of Serpentis. Even the suitcase looked like it was worth a fortune. Meanwhile, the sirens were getting louder. Wincing, he pulled himself back into the MTAC. With excruciating effort, he marched the machine up to the speeder and used its arms to lift the wreck up. Bits of mangled junk fell from the underside, but the passenger remained steady. The hangar door had barely closed when the first of three Federation police spaders roared past the shop. Jacobs wondered if any had noticed the debris field and dent on the wall. At the velocity they were traveling, probably not. But they could later on when the sun came back up. Setting the wreck down, he used the robotic, robotic arm to pull the limp body of his assailant onto the hangar floor. The man was breathing good air now, but remained unconscious. There may have been other injuries, but Jacobs didn't care. The shuttle with the disassembled engine had a large cargo bay. The wreck would fit inside of it. Once the task was done, Jacobs returned to his victim. There was an old cot inside the office. It would do nicely for the patient. Jacobs immobilized him with canvas straps and sat down across from him with the gun in hand, waiting for him to wake up. He was shaking violently, as if dipped in a pool of ice water, fighting the urge to vomit. He swore that he would never become angry again. The patient woke up an hour later. He was older, bald, with cropped gray hair on the sides of his head. He was immaculately dressed, wearing stylish business attire that clearly marked him as an off-worlder. Physically, he was also much more formidable than Jacobs. Why the restraints, he asked, with a thick and talky accent. You tried to kill me, Jacobs answered. My sincerest apologies, he answered. I thought you were a Federation officer. Well, how do you know I'm not one? The stranger said, feds have more sophisticated ways of securing prisoners, eyeing the crude restraints on his wrists, assuming that's what you think I am now. Given the circumstances, Jacobs said, bringing the gun into view, I'd say the police are the least of your concerns. The Intaki smiled broadly. Jacobs didn't want to become angry, and his throbbing shoulder reminded him so. Clearly, the Intaki said. So then, what will you do now? His smirk implied that he was certain Jacobs didn't know the answer to that question. On that count, he would be right. We got off to a bad start, the stranger said. My name is Savant. I arrived, here a short I arrived here a short while ago. I saw the drugs in your speeder, Jacob said. That's a bit much for casual consumption. Yes, I was on my way to fill orders for clients, 
Savant said, but was sidetracked. Jacus looked at him. I should turn you into the cops. Yes, Savant said, you probably should, except you hid me from them and moved my speeder off the road. That makes you guilty of, Jacus interrupted, conspiracy and tampering with evidence. Yes, Savant said. So then why did you do it? Jacus said nothing, barely aware that he was strumming his finger over the gun. I see, Savant mused, smiling pleasantly, taking in his surroundings. It's rather late. Are you the proprietor here? Colonies are ruined because of people like you, Jacob said. Zavant looked as though he was insulted by the common. But you hardly even know me, he said. Drugs ruin people, Jacob said, starting to lose his patience. You're with Serpentis, aren't you? Savant smiled at him. Drugs have been part of our culture for thousands of years, he said. The Antaki wouldn't have survived without them. You know, he said, looking around casually, this shop is using very dated equipment. That's an interesting take on history, Jacob said, now struggling to contain his anger. You think it's worth all the misery it causes? Drugs have made me a wealthy man, Savant answered, but that's secondary to the high I get from helping people. All right, Jacob sneered. Helping people what, become addicts? No, Savant said, becoming serious. Helping them cope, numbing the pain of a difficult life. By giving them a chemical dependency? You hypocrite. Savant looked at Jacob thoughtfully. If a man loses a limb and you replace that limb with something artificial, then you replace that limb with something artificial. If the loss of a child tears the soul out of a parent, you use chemicals to lift them until he finds the strength to carry on. Both are tragic dependencies, yet serve the same noble purpose, to compensate for a debilitating limitation. So, how has business been for you? Jacob shook his head. Doctors determine what's noble, not you. Actually, Savant said, I prefer the term physician, of which I happen to be. I don't believe you, Jacob said. Not surprising, since you've been institutionalized by Federation propaganda to think we're all thugs. For your information, most of Serpentis is composed of, of physicians. It isn't the evil empire you think it is. If you don't mind my saying, I get the impression that this shop isn't doing well at all. That isn't your concern, Jacob said. I'll make it my concern if you'll allow, Savant answered, jutting his chin towards the straps on his wrists. It's the least I can do in return for all the goodwill you've shown to me. Jacob almost smiled. In truth, he always knew deep down he was just going to let the man go. But understanding why he had detained him in the first place was becoming increasingly obscure. Whatever you're up to, I don't want any part of it, Jacob said, but you're right. It's not going the way I hoped it would here. Savant smiled. You didn't think building a life here would be easy, did you? I don't believe I caught your name. My name is Jacus Roden. Pleasure to meet you, Jacus. Thank you for saving my life. What's the name of your enterprise? Roden Shipyards. Ah, has a certain ring to it, I'll admit. In exchange for your kindness and compensation for shooting at you, I make two offers. 300,000 credits for shop up upgrades and, and parts inventory and a steady stream of new business. Jacobs nearly let his jaw drop. It was an astronomical figure, but he wasn't stupid. Right, a steady stream of serpentous business. Savant turned serious again. I never specified from whom the business would originate. Right, Jacobs said, exasperated. Thanks, but that's not necessary. Let's just call it even. You don't believe my offer was sincere, Savant asked. Jacobs winced at the pain in his shoulder. He was suddenly exhausted. You put on a good show, I'll give you that, he said, starting towards him. Let me cut you loose. There's no need, Savant said, sitting up effortlessly. The straps fell away from his wrists. I'll let myself up, thank you very much. Jacobs froze. Microblade, sewn into the seams, Savant continued, passing his wrist over the leg bindings, which also fell away. They work quite well on most restraints. You should give me my weapon back. Jacob stared at the gun in his trembling hand. You can't fire it, Savant warned, who is now walking towards him. Biometric safety. Only I can pull that trigger. Jacob nearly swung the gun around at the approaching figure, but again, instinct stopped him from taking action. Savant gently took the weapon back. Sabotage setting, he said, tapping the gun. A chirp acknowledged its subtle hand movement. Had you attempted to fire, it would have melted in your hand. 
Jacus began stepping backwards. You know, Savant said, stretching lazily, caressing, carelessly waving the gun around, I'm an expert shot. From that range, you were a sure thing. Fortunately for us, oxygen deprivation is bad for motor skills. The gun disappeared into his expensive long coat. Out came a data pad. Your credits are waiting to be claimed, Savant said. I can't take that, Jacob said cautiously. It's blood money. Collecting dividends from PharmaCorp stock is no different, Savant said, typing away in the device. Trust me, they've spilled more blood than anyone. I don't want any involvement with Serpentis, Jacob said firmly. Why do you keep saying that name, Savant asked, tucking the data pad away. He gave him a stern look. What I would like is for you to fix all the craft that come through here. I realize that having customers is something you're unaccustomed to, so use those funds to hire the right people and get the right equipment. Jake has sat back down in his chair. I haven't asked you to do anything illegal, Savant said, peering into the hangar adjacent to the room. You saved my life, remarkably so, while under fire. You have good instincts. You should be rewarded for what you did. Instincts, Jake has thought. That must be it. If customers come through my door, who am I to turn them away, he said. Savant smiled. This is the break you've been looking for, he said. Now, let's have a look at that shoulder of yours. I might have just the thing to dull the pain. All right, that's the end of that. Thank you. Now, one of the things that I, I didn't do enough of in, in the first book was good character development, and that's because probably about a third of, if not 50% of the book is just ex was exposition. It was, it was intended to introduce the layman to the broad Eve backstory, so you had to spell out what in the holy hell is the difference between Amar, Mimitar, Matar, Nefentar, all these tars, and by the time you get done explaining what all the tars are, there's no room left to tell stories about people, which is really what the, the game is and the setting is all about. So, Jacus Roden has a piece of this story in terms of how, or he's a major player in how the first immortal soldier of New Eden is, is revealed to, to the world. Um, I can't say any more about to what degree he plays the part, but I think it's fascinating to know how he goes from this young, young kid with the real entrepreneurial uh, drive to uh, becoming this, the president of the Galente Federation, one of the most powerful empires in, in civilization. It's a long road, and to be perfectly frank with you, I don't finish that telling that story in this book. I start it, but I leave him at a crossroads, and then I hope to continue it later on, maybe even with the help of the content group. But Enough about the book, let's, let's talk a little bit about where the IP is today. Oh yeah, this is modern technology, I can do this. What, what have we been up to? Uh, it came up during the content panel before that we've kinda, you may have noticed we've slowed down in introducing new story. Uh, there's very good reason for this. It's because we've been preparing for war. Uh, we're, we're, we're really laying, trying to lay down, uh, solidify our foundation before the IP just explodes in terms of content and, and depth and, and, and storyline. Dust 514 is going, is going to, uh, it'll be a continuation of the story of Eve, but it just adds a whole nother dimension to what, uh, to what we've started here. Um, if there is one takeaway you leave Iceland with, assuming that this isn't where you live, it is absolutely important that you all understand that Eve online, Dust514, Incarna, these are not separate entities. And though they're, we tend to focus on them individually because we're so passionate about Eve and we don't want to see anything detract from that, it's important you see the big picture that all of these things are different perspectives of the same universe. It is not a separate product. They are not, they are not separate uh, paradigms. They're all underneath one IP. And we are laying the foundation for something that can continue to grow indefinitely. They're just multiple, they're different perspectives of the same game world. Um, 2010 was an epic year for us. It marked a true inflection point uh, for Eve because for the first meaningful time, really since 2003, we've been able to put a face on a story. 
I think that incursion uh, was, was probably the, the first time, at least since, really since factional warfare, in which we've been able to put a face. Now, whether you sympathize with, with Sancho Kovaki or not, and most people do not, most people think of him as a madman, he was successfully painted gray, and more or less we were able to put a face on the emotion and make the story of Eve that much more compelling. I said it in the last panel, and I'll say it again here. This is the last fan fest where it's just about talking spaceships. We can put a face on these guys now. You can empathize with this. It's in our DNA. We look people in the, in the eyes. Well, I don't when I talk because I have this phobia about speaking in public places. But we look people in the eye when we talk to them because we, we, you just connect with them emotionally. I thought that this trailer, uh, what we were able to do with it, could give players a role, a role in it, give them a mechanic to, to, to meaningfully interact with each other, and at the support it all by, with the rich backstory was of just a beautiful confluence of events. Um, where do we take this from here? Well, as epic as this rollout was and showing the possibilities of where we can go with Incarna, um, we still have a lot of work to do. Now, if Steve Jobs can stand in front of, in front of the world and, and admit that, well, we, we got to man up and do the same. There, there's a lot of things that we haven't done right, to be, to be quite frank with you. Um, I don't know, does anybody, everybody here recognize what that is? Exactly. That, that, is, that is the Ishikone HQ station in Malkalin, which has been on fire since the Knicks crashed into it in 2007. Uh, it's the year 23,000 and change. These guys probably have a fire extinguisher laying around, you know. Uh, we're, we, we haven't been consistent in terms of keeping things going, and, and while, while there's, there's good reasons for that, I think, I think that at the same time we need to do a better job of integrating storyline with actual development. You know, it's, it's like the art guys have a, have a med medieval schedule right now that uh, they are so completely overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that they have to do for Incarnate that things like that just keep getting pushed further and further down the backlog. But when they see it, they leave a wealth in their foreheads too. So this is something that we need to address right now ourselves. But more importantly, from an IP perspective, we need to find more meaningful ways to tell stories in game. And the incursion story, the story about Sancho Kovaki was the perfect example of the nine out of 10 implementation of that role. Most of our storytelling is in prose trapped in the words that a character says, the protagonist says to an antagonist, you know, and this stuff is great. We are not, to be clear, against walls of text. The problem is that if we don't start distilling the fine elements from that, what the actual canon is from all the stories that have been told over the years, when dust comes around, we're going to be completely overwhelmed and unorganized, and we need to use the canon that we have to solidify our base before we take this next step. To that, we have yeah, I just realized, I see now why Sancho Kovaki doesn't actually have hair. Um, it makes the most sense for the guy that wrote most of the fiction to, to, to be the lead in the person that's helping distill it into canon that you can experience more in the game. You take him, you introduce him to the director of content, CCP Malik, and between the two of them, you get the result of something like the Incursion Experience, where we have a meaningful story where players unwittingly, just by virtue of participating in a live event or in, a, in an incursion, are exposed to the backstory in a way that's meaningful. They see, okay, I see red crosses, I'm gonna shoot at them, but someone's shooting at me because I'm shooting at the red cross, which implies there's a conflict here and dark shades of gray, and that's exactly the kind of experience we wanna deliver. There's just enough storytelling, the walls of text are there for the people who are totally engaged and wanna learn more. Would you like to learn more? Right? It's all there for them, but at the same time, it's exposed to everyone, whether they're willing to get there or not. So, where is this, this paradigm going? What direction are we heading in here with all this? To be clear, we want to always make sure that we can continue to expose parts of the universe that we can't necessarily show you in game. This is a painting, uh, you know, going back, all these chronicles here, 
Um, we had an art pipeline. They outsourced uh, all the artwork for them. And once the Chronicle stopped being a bi-monthly delivery, we still had these, these artists there and said, hey, listen, can you just throw some content on it? What would it look like, for example, a Caldari station under construction? Okay. And they came back with this, and everyone kind of looked at it and said, you know, I never actually thought about what it would take to build something this big. The inspiration for this painting, maybe you've seen, it's a black and white photo of some guys from the 20s sitting on an I-beam that's like 50, 50 stories up in the air, eating lunch casually like nothing happened. And with this, the, these kind of things are important to us because they, 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 they stimulate discussion about ways we can make Evilpedia better, for example, better ways we can illustrate the story instead of just, you know, white font on black text endlessly. Let's put things in there and show aspects of the universe that none of us have ever seen before. The other thing we wanted to do is take iconic moments in the history and bring them to life finally. Instead of just us, like, for, does anyone recognize what this is? Has anyone even seen this before? This is on Evilpedia. That's an MTAC on the Armor Forge, and Tybus Heth is driving, is at the controls there. This is, this is the iconic moment that launched his career in politics when that negotiator went out and was sniped. And he went out, you know, grabbed into a cargo rig, ran out, grabbed some starship armor, put it in front of him, ran out there and tried to save the guy's life. Being able to bring these moments to life just make the, everything that we do so much more immersive. Again, this is not a rant against walls of text. We're just trying to find ways to make it more immersive. Okay, tech porn. What's not to love about tech porn? If, 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 if we have anything in common, I'd like to think that if you were anything like me growing up, you just salivated over things like, like the technical blueprints of like the Enterprise or Star Destroyer. Just, you know, you just love that. I mean, I used to hang X-wings and, and all kinds of stuff from my, from my ceiling and I wanted to learn as much about that thing as possible. We have all these iconic images in, in a, like, like we have, like this is just a wireframe export from, from Jessica, the, con the, the, the dev tool, and uh, that's from 2002. And since 2002, that's all we have. And to me, that's like, I think one of the, the, the hard things about, about, about EVE is that we have an armada of ships, all, any, one of, any one of which could become iconic, but we just don't know enough about them, except that you just think about doing something, and this gigantic machine that's three kilometers long does it. The, we want to be able to go into a ship, and we want to be able to see, you know, how big are the reactors, the aneutronic fusion reactors that, uh, you know, that, that, that power this thing are. Where are the shield emitters? Where is the toilet? You know, that where, like, what, who, who, how does this big thing come together, and how can we, you know, with all this technology, it's like we have an iPod, we have a mobile phone. Wouldn't it be great to push that content to your device and have, like, a three-view drawing of it, like a three-dimensional drawing to just explore? We could, we could, we could grow exponential. Well we could get so much more interest in EVE if we were able to do these things. So, one thing that is absolutely on our radar right now is to be able to bring these things to life. Ship crews, we've written about them long enough. This is something we haven't been good at either. That, that chart has been around for a long time and we haven't published it yet. And we look at each other and we say, well, why the F haven't we published it yet? And then we get, we get, we get we get sidetracked into doing what we need to do to get through a release. We are going to publish this within the next two weeks. It's the least we can do. There's a lot of content laying around the office that's been vetted, that we've all gone around and, and, and talked about endlessly and came up with something that makes sense. Many of those ideas are stuff we pulled directly from feedback in the community. There's been threads where guys are talking about this thing and kind of brainstorming out loud of how many guys are actually running around the halls of these ships. And we say, you know, something that actually makes sense. Um, in this particular chart, the minimum crew size is basically the bare bones that you need to get a ship out of a station without any modules on it at all. The capsular variants always require less people. The maximum capacity is with the ship, with all of its models and slots filled up, you know, defenses, offenses, all that stuff, and people kind of, you know, in the cargo hold and fit kind of snugly in the halls. And the statistical average survival rate we determined, this is based on kind of an attrition type fight with a ship of the same class. Obviously, if you get one-shotted by a Titan, zero survivors. 
but we, we, if you're, you know, if it's a, it's a cruiser versus cruiser, those guys could trade for a long time, and when the fight starts to go badly, there would be time to get people off. And we make, we, we even went as far as just like, you know, racial adjustments. You know, it's like Galente would probably have the bare bones minimum crew because they're reliant so much on drones. Mimitar likes doing everything the hard way. Of course, it's packed with lots of people, heaving artillery shells around and that kind of, pretty much guys in, in you know, rowing like this to get the tempest out of the, out, out of, out of the dock. The next thing we're going to turn our focus to as we, as we march closer to Dust 514 is we really need to do a better job of building up the, uh, the backstories of the mega corporations. These are hugely powerful entities that are probably just as, 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 as important as, uh, uh, as really the empires. They have just as much power. power. Um, this is actually uh, going to be uh, the primary arms manufacturers for, for or most likely going to be the primary arms manufacturers for, for Dust 514 weapons. Please keep in mind that, uh, you know, an AK-47 and an M4A1 cult are both the same kind of weapon in terms of why, how they were conceived. It's like, if you absolutely want precision and quality, you go for the red dot reflex sight M4A1 cult. But if you need to like fund a rebellion, you buy the AK-47s in bulk. And so, so all of these, you know, the Galente can build a laser weapon. It's just if you want a damn good one, you go to, you go to, you go to Visium to buy it. And that's the kind of direction we're, we're, we're approaching for, for. We have to start going from this big, epic starship size scale and start thinking about what needs to happen on the ground to support what's going on up there. Uh, and these are great things to think about out loud but I'm gonna not do that anymore here because I think I'm, I'm getting close to the, to the wire here. Um, Evilopedia, we are not happy with it right now. It is the most underutilized tool uh, that we have for, for, for telling the Eve story. In, in particular, its main purpose is really is, is kind of like a, uh, a, a central repository for Eve's history. Um, this is probably the most informative page that no one's ever heard about. We have, with the help of Mr. Nick Bargely, who is sitting here in the crowd today, please give him a hand. Uh, he went back in time, took a, took a dump of TQ logs, and reconstructed every single major engagement in NullSec for the entire year of 2000. I think it was half of 2008 and all of 2009. Uh, we used the YC uh, nomenclature there, and I... ULI conference thing. It always confuses the shit out of us. I always have to look on internally, see what year YC 112 is. But uh, that's for 2008. You can click on any one of these uh, and you get this. I think the rules are at least 100 battleships had to have been killed and or five capital ships and or some kind of sovereignty change would have needed to happen. Now this is just two months in, uh, I believe, 2008 and 2009, and look at how much stuff is there. That's all player history. Players did every single bit of it. If you click on one, if you click on the top one, you get all this information. It shows where it happened. It shows, the description practically shows how it happened, and it provides a context of what was going on when this epic battle took place. Now, all this information is scattered all over the place on different websites, and for a new person to come into the game, he has to wade through all this piss and vinegar on COAD to get some semblance of what's going on. We created this page so that people could quickly go in and get informed, but what we're really hoping happens is that the people who participated in these fights go to Evilopedia, change the names of these battles to whatever it is that they want, but more importantly, add their history to us, to our games, so that it lasts forever, like the way we sell it. This is player legacy, this is player-made history, Please share it with us so that there's an archive of it for future generations of EVE players to come back and tell. If you've been playing the game as long as I have, the name Moo still, gives, still sends a chill up your spine. And new players have no idea what that means. But they were epic back in the day. They provided so much content for everyone else. So. Uh, the, o the other thing that we're doing right now is uh, we're, we're, we want to start pushing player-made news out to the forefront of, of what we see. We touched on it during the content panel. Um, you know, you can only have so many mining accidents. You know, you can only have so many cathedral mishaps and, and all this other stuff. It's, we want to 
limit the news to it either needs to be supporting an upcoming expansion or some major storyline event that we have the means to support in game or players have to be able to interact with it directly. That's why we're, we've kind of toned back on the fluff. And I, as much as I hate it because it's not fluff, really great writers go into producing that stuff, but it's just kind of noise that doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? If we put news on the front page of the website, you damn well better have some way of reacting to it. It has to mean something. Or else it's just kind of, you start to not read them after a while. And for the amount of effort that goes into making them, we just don't feel like we were getting you know, enough return on the investment. So uh, the Corpse Report, Capsular Out of Region Political Summary, is that report for the layman, where every month, it used to, we used to do it twice a month, but now we just backed it down to a month. A new player could come in and read about these brand names like IT Alliance and Red Alliance and all these guys. Oh, who are they? That's interesting. We read about, they can speak in somewhat intelligent terms about what's been going on in the sandbox. And that's what we want. We need more players to engage with this thing. There's lots of opportunities, especially with the incursion mechanic. I haven't heard about it happening yet, as far as I know, they're being ignored, but incursions can pop up in, in null sec space. Now, I don't know if players have been ignoring them or not, but that it could happen during in the midst of a, of a resource contention, of, of, of a battle, and that's gonna change the calculus of how that war is fought. Uh, so, anyway, that's all I got, fellas. I'm, I'm open for questions for, for, for about 10 minutes or, or whatever, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Are you giving them full grace to actually feel like they're doing something cool if they go in and just like hang out and have fun? Well, what winds up, I honestly don't know, and that's a great question, how I can incentivize them other than them just wanting to make sure the right story is told. One of the reasons why we've been, you know, history is told by the victor. You know what I mean? And, and, and one of the things we haven't been very fearless about in the past is that we've always been terrified of getting the story wrong and then being accused of bias afterwards. So I think what we're gonna wind up doing, the part of the wiki puzzle that we haven't figured out yet is who moderates this stuff, you know what I mean? What, what, if we get open up to everyone, the loser could come in and just post some completely bogus. We don't want the, 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 the wiki to necessarily become part of the metagaming component of Sandbox. So, you know, there's so much that goes on in the forum, so much nastiness. They don't need another tool to help, to help uh, uh, there's, no, there's no doubt. I would, I mean, why wouldn't you? That's, that's part of the fun. Um, but thinking about ways to incentivize something is definitely something we gotta we gotta have a brainstorm about. So, anybody else? Oh, thank God! All right, mm. that's all I got, guys. Thank you very much.